All right. And then we're going to move on to our study session, which is the airport program noise study session by the city attorney's office. And prior to starting that session, I'd, I'd like to say that prior to starting the study session, I'd just like to remind everyone who's here that there will be a separate public comment period after the presentation. As such, if you would like to comment on tonight's study session item, uh, then please fill out a blue card and submit it to the city clerk and we'll take your comments during public comment period. So with that, I'd like the city attorney to begin the study session. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, members of the city council, members of the public and staff. Um, we're very fortunate tonight. This is going to be a joint session about noise. Um, and Peter Kirsch, who is outside counsel to the city on all matters airport, will be um, doing the session with Monica Newhouse from the airport. And the two of them, as well as Mark Hardman, have been working on this um, together. Um, I got the fun part of just helping along, but they've really taken the laboring oar on this, and I think it'll be very informative. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to ask Peter and Monica to come on up, and they're going to do this sort of tag team at the podium. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. What we want to do this evening is give you a little bit of Noise 101 and talk about the Burbank Airport noise reduction program so that everybody understands what has gone on historically and what is going on today at the uh, at the airport. Can we have the first slide, please? Um, we're, we're going to break this presentation tonight. Mr. Hirsch, I'm, uh, Kirsch, I'm just going to interrupt you to ask you to speak directly into the microphone. And you can, it's very flexible. You can move it back and forth. But we'll it's important. Move it back that, and that's forth right. Depending on who's speaking. <laughs> Everybody needs to hear what you have to say this evening. I, I apologize. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, our presentation this evening, and you'll hear us going back and forth because, because each of us know, is, is an expert in different things. So uh, one or the other of us will answer questions you may have. We want to talk about the history of noise at the airport. What what has happened over the course of the last generation or so, talk about what the future of noise impacts are, what has been accomplished in terms of noise mitigation, what is the future, what, what further mitigation is available, and then we'll talk a little bit about key questions to consider. The, the reason for the presentation is frankly to make sure that we start out conversations about noise as we talk about the future of the airport and the future of the opportunity site, to make sure that everybody knows the facts, if you will, about what is, what is and is not going on at the airport. Monica? So to begin with a little bit of aircraft noise 101 is to talk a little bit about the perception of noise. And both the perception and the calculation of aircraft noise is a function of a number of things. The first being the number of operations. That's both arrivals and departures going into and out of an airport, the location of where those, those flights fly, uh, otherwise known as aircraft routes, the type of aircraft, and specifically the type of engine on that aircraft, and also the time of day. And that's especially uh, important because evening flights between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. are penalized in the calculation of noise because they are more disruptive to our evening enjoyment in our homes, and nighttime are penalized tenfold. So that's all of those elements go into ca the calculation of noise, because those two are um, penalized because they tend to be more disruptive. So since the 70s, the number of flights at Bob Hope Airport have decreased. And uh, we've got some slides that show uh, that trend a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the location of the flight tracks is unchanged, hasn't changed. Uh, aircraft engines have become dramatically quieter. The engine technology has changed immensely since the 70s. And our nighttime operations have decreased. This is the slide I was referring to, and uh, this is our latest airport forecast. That's the part with the blue sky going forward, whereas the historical operations are in the red. Uh, the forecast comes from uh, the most recent Part 150 study update, and uh, it looks the forecast itself looks at market share uh, of the airport, uh, the population in the surrounding areas, employment, total personal income, all of these elements to create this forecast. But given the recent declines in 
passenger traffic due to the recession um, and continued fuel price uncertainty, which has a major effect on our airlines, it's not anticipated that there will be a major rebound in the traffic growth, particularly uh, at Bob Hope Airport. And in 2011, emplanements were the lowest they've been in 19 years at Bob Hope Airport. Um, we're not anticipated to return, as you can see in the slide, we're not anticipating a return to even 2007 operational levels until well past 2030. And much the way airports have mitigated noise through sound insulation programs, um, Aircraft manufacturers have uh, developed aircraft that employ a whole new series of tech new technology to abate the noise at the source. And um, though there will never be a silent aircraft, there are some that actually the wind over the surfaces of the plane exceeds the noise from the engines on arrival. Um, there's a lot of impressive progress has been made. What you can see here is a comparison. Uh, on the left-hand side are historic aircraft types, and all of this is to scale. So you can see the difference in the size of the aircraft. So I'll take um, the very top left is a 727-200. Uh, they don't fly at Bob Hope Airport anymore, but they were very prevalent in the 70s and 80s. And you can compare that with uh, a similar, similarly sized aircraft, which is 737. Uh, 300, it's a little bit bigger, but it is dramatically quieter. They have more seats on those flights, as, on those planes as well. So having additional seats means fewer flights. Monica, could I just jump in here for a moment? Because I want to, particularly for people at home who are looking at this graph, it's very important. And what it shows is how much quieter each individual aircraft is today than it was back in the 1970s. These, the, for the benefit of the people at home, these are noise contours showing how large the contour is behind each of the aircraft. The ones on the left-hand side are the ones that were in operation from 1978 to 1990 on the right-hand side, the present aircraft. It is, it's pretty dramatic, particularly when when you look at the very top aircraft, which was the most prevalent commercial aircraft in each of those time periods, and how much smaller the noise contour is today. So when we talk about the fact that noise has decreased, a large part of it is a function of change in technology. Absolutely. And 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 I'm, I apologize that this that this graph is a little hard to read on the screen, but I think it, it it's it's a pretty dramatic indication of why it is that we're seeing noise contours so much smaller today. And to speak to that, you can see the change in the noise contours over time. Uh, this slide represents the uh, first Part 150 study noise contour uh, in 1988, and it encompassed over 1,500 acres. In 98, which was two years before the mandatory uh, phase out of stage two jets, the noise exposure area uh, was reduced to 1,250 acres. In 2008, the, con the noise uh, exposure area continued to decrease to only 873 acres. And today, the combination of quieter aircraft and a decrease in the operations at the airport have led to a noise exposure area measuring some 668 acres. This is a comparison of all of them. You can see the continual decrease from 1988 to the current year. And just as we were comparing actual noise exposure contours, you can look at the forecast contours here. Um, the yellow line represents the 2003 forecast from the 1998 Part 150 study update. And the green line represents the forecast for 2017 that was derived in the most recent Part 150 study. I think what this data shows is that the noise levels today, using all the various metrics that are used to measure noise, are substantially lower than they have been in the past. 
And the good news is this is not a temporary phenomenon. That, that is, the noise is unlikely ever to reach the peak that it, that it reached at Burbank Airport in 1978. No matter how much traffic there is, no matter what happens at this airport, it will never get that bad. And secondly, as Monica indicated with the projections of future traffic at this airport because of factors that really have nothing to do with Burbank, the total aircraft traffic is not projected to reach the peak from 1989 for many decades to come. So a combination of the fact that the noise is not going to increase back to what we have historically seen, particularly people who've lived in Burbank for a generation, and the traffic is not likely to reach that level, says that the impacts of the airport in terms of the noise environment are never going to get to what we had experienced a, a, a number of years ago. So with that background, if you will, on noise as noise, let's talk about what's been done and what is being done to address noise. And, and this graphic, I think, is a, is a good way of illustrating both what the city and the authority have done really since the 1960s or 70s to address noise. You'll see over at the far left-hand end was the first effort to address noise, which was the city's curfew ordinance in 1970. That ordinance was later declared unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court and led to a number, a series of additional efforts both by the city and by the authority over the course of literally the last 50 years. And, and of course over on the right hand side are the current efforts, most especially the city and the authority's joint effort to seek legislation for a curfew, the, uh, the airport authority sound insulation program that Monica will talk about in a moment, um, and the authority's continued enforcement of its noise rules to make sure that aircraft are, are adhered hearing to, the, to the, the quietest possible flying possible. So let me go through, if I can, a little bit of the history of these efforts, because I think it's important to put in context today by looking back, if you will, to the 1970s. So the city has been working on noise mitigation since before there was an airport authority, from back when the airport was run privately by the Lockheed Corporation. Uh, the city, as I mentioned, tried to impose a curfew in 1970 when Lockheed still owned the airport, and that effort was struck down by the Supreme Court a number of years later. That said, the airport has had noise rules in place since about the 1978-1980 uh, time frame, which limit the noisiest aircraft um, and require pilots to follow quiet flying procedures as they depart from the aircraft from the airport. Um, we do have a voluntary curfew that dates all the way back into the 70s before the authority was formed. And beginning in 1987, the airlines required to use only stage three equipment, that is the quietest aircraft engines. And that was 13 years before the federal government mandated their, um, uh, uh, before they were mandated to be removed from the fleet. The authority has also been sound insulating homes uh, and schools since the late 1980s and has spent uh, over $105 million in doing so. Uh, as of June of this year, we have sound insulated 2,350 residences and four elementary schools. Only 75 single family residences remain to be insulated, and um, 40 of which are in the Burbank community. I think it's fair to say that there is no airport in the country, maybe in the world, whose noise efforts have been more carefully scrutinized than Burbank. Uh, Burbank, in many respects, is a model for the rest of the world in terms of its addressing noise problems proactively. One key way in which the airport authority has been required to, to if you will, uh, continue its noise mitigation efforts is that it's required to report to Caltrans every approximately three years on what it has done to mitigate noise and to put forth a plan for what it's going to be doing to mitigate noise in the future. And to put not too fine a point on it, Caltrans has been very vigorous in making sure that the authority already sticks to its plan. So Caltrans imposed detailed noise mitigation requirements on the authority in 1998, again in 2002, and again in 2007. The, the next Caltrans proceeding to consider noise mitigation has been temporarily postponed as a result of the city and the, the authority discussions about long-term solutions, some of which we've already talked to, to council about in previous sessions. 
the authorities' aggressive FAA and Caltrans approved uh, noise mitigation efforts have included the construction of Taxiway D to promote uh, general aviation use during the nighttime hours uh, for departures to the west. Uh, it has uh, also the phase out of operations of the all stage two commercial aircraft long before the federal mandate of 2000 and a very sophisticated noise monitoring and reporting uh, system um, that is available even to the public through our website and uh, we have the ability to research any and every complaint about aircraft noise. After the city tried to impose a curfew unsuccessfully on the airport in 1970, discussions about a curfew have continued really nonstop since then. Federal law changed in 1990 to require that any curfew that's imposed receive permission from the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, before it can be adopted. So under pressure from the city, the authority applied for permission to impose a curfew under federal law. That application, you've heard before is called a Part 161 study, named after the part of the federal regulations that mandates the study. Uh, to say that this was a long, expensive, laborious process barely begins to touch the surface. I mean, just by illustration, the process took nine years and cost $7 million. Um, at the end of that, again, to not put too fine a point on it and perhaps to be a little blunt, uh, the FAA rejected the application in the strongest possible terms to say that the federal government was not going to give the airport authority permission to impose a curfew. This was important because it was the last effort to, uh, to uh, achieve a curfew through an administrative process. So what is next? What's, what are we going to do going forward for uh, mitigation? So we have almost completed the noise uh, sound insulation uh, for uh, residences within the noise affected areas um, as allowed by federal law. I want to be clear here because I don't know that my, my point here is we are continuing to seek federal funds to finish insulating those sing single family homes that remain. However, we are actively still sound insulating. We have active grants that uh, we are still s actively sound insulating today. We have uh, homes, we're still signing up homeowners, we still have uh, uh, funds available to do sound insulation on these homes. So uh, I want to be clear about that. We're also seeking federal authorization through the Part 150 study update process to insulate multifamily homes. That's only three in Burbank, but it is another 114 in the Los Angeles area. Other ongoing efforts uh, is, is continued enforcement of the airport noise rules. Um, they are evaluated every day. If there is an operation by a stage two business jet at night, they are evaluated. We have only had one violation of the noise rule where uh, an aircraft has been fined in the last five years, one. But every one that, that goes out is investigated to make sure that they have either complied uh, with, what the, with the noise rules but, but every single one is investigated, but only one has, has been fined because they know the rules. They know there is a fine. It's very highly publicized. Every pilot who flies into Burbank knows uh, about the noise rules. And uh, we encourage continued compliance with the 30-year-old voluntary curfew. For scheduled air carriers, we uh, even have, we've had schedule changes that went right outside of the uh, curfews. The authority has uh, written letters and those schedule changes have been made to, to ensure that they are strictly in compliance. So the issue of a curfew has been something that's been pursued through a number of different mechanisms. The city tried a curfew uh, through its own ordinance process. There has been litigation over a curfew. The airport authority tried to impose a curfew through the administrative process, the Part 161 study. There's only one avenue left, and that's legislation. Uh, to use an expression or overuse an expression, uh, getting a curfew now requires an act of Congress. And an act of Congress is not an easy thing. Well. It's never an easy thing. In the current Congress, it's particularly a difficult thing. But it's the last vehicle that's available. And the authority in the city
Committee are aggressively pursuing that, thanks in large part to Congressman Schiff and Sherman, who have been in, who, who have drafted legislation. They've introduced it several times. Uh, as far as we can tell, they will never stop introducing it, and they will keep seeking congressional support. Each year, they get a little more support for the legislation. And again, it's it, it's our last effort, and it's a very important last effort to uh, to secure a curfew. The final issue uh, that, that I'd like to talk about before sort of summing up here is, is I know there's been a lot of discussion and frankly a lot of misinformation about the issue of eastern departures off the shorter runway at the airport. It's an issue that's been, been a grave concern to Burbank residents and I want to make sure that people understand why it is aircraft do or don't, don't use that procedure. Most importantly, there's been a fair amount of misinformation that the terminal itself is the reason that aircraft don't depart to the east over Burbank. There are really four or five reasons why aircraft do not travel to the east. That is why they don't use the shorter runway and, and fly off to the east over Burbank. First of all, prevailing winds. The winds are such that aircraft aircraft have to take off into the wind. And the prevailing winds are such that the north-south runway, known as runway 1533, is much favored over the what's known as crosswind runway, hence the name. It goes across the wind. It is very unusual for the wind pattern to allow the use of that runway to the east. Secondly, maybe the most obvious, is the Verdugo Mountains are to the east. And, and, and aircraft have to climb very quickly, in a, in a sense unsafely, to get over the Verdugo Mountains if they fly to the east. Number three, the air traffic patterns in Southern California are mind-bogglingly complex. And so aircraft can't just take off from Burbank and go where they're going. Uh, that there are traffic, there's traffic for all the other LA airports. And the way air traffic routes in Southern California are organized, if aircraft take off from the east, it is far more complex for them to fit into the flow of air traffic over Southern California. The next to the last is a, is a hyper-technical issue, and I'll try to make this as, as simple as I can, but uh, and, and without scaring you. Uh, air, um, uh, commercial airlines are required to have what are known as one-engine inoperable procedures, or OEI procedures. What these are, are procedures they adopt, what happens when they take off if one of the engines goes out very dangerous situation, but they have to plan for that so the aircraft, God forbid, nothing happens. The aircraft, each, each airline has a set of procedures for OEI, for one engine inoperable. Aircraft taking off to the east don't have a procedure they can use safely to take off and to avoid other traffic. Because if they have one engine out, they're only flying on one engine. So essentially what they have to do is the procedure has to have them circle around the airport and come back around. Because of the other traffic in the area, it is not safe for most commercial airliners to take off to the east and adhere to their OEI procedure. So as a result, they're not allowed to do that. That has nothing to do with the Verdugo Mountains. That has nothing to do with the other air traffic. It has nothing to do with the wind. It has to do with the fact that they simply don't have those procedures. And the final, the, final, the fifth reason why there aren't uh, very many uh, flights to the east and why there never will be is perhaps the simplest, which is that airlines, air, uh, pilots, aircraft operators always prefer to use a longer runway if they can, and runway 1533 is far longer than, they, than the crosswind runway. So all of these factors are important to understand. I, notice I didn't say the location of the terminal was a factor, because it really isn't the, a predominant factor. These five factors are all much more important than the location of the terminal for the reason for why um, uh, aircraft do not depart to the east. So let me, if I can, summarize what, what we've gone through in, in the last 15, 20 minutes or so here. Um, and uh, if, I, if I can sort of tee up the conversation with, with the council by asking and answering a couple of questions. First of all, does the number of passengers at an airport affect its noise? And the answer is no. Noise is not produced by passengers. Noise is produced by aircraft. Pretty obvious, OK? Secondly, and I, this goes to my last point, does the location of the terminal affect noise? We go back to Monica's very first slide where she talks about flight tracks and the kind of aircraft and the time of day. The location of the terminal does not affect where and how much noise there is from the, from the airport. 
Number three, does the size of the terminal have any effect on noise? And again, similar to the location, the size does not affect noise, it's the aircraft that affect noise. And find the final point, which is obviously a point that's going to be discussed considerably over the course of the next several weeks and months, if a 14-gate replacement terminal were approved for this airport, would it change the noise status quo? And I think as Monica's data showed, the answer is no. That is, the noise is a function of where the aircraft fly, how many aircraft there are. And if you look back at the contours that Monica showed earlier, you will see that, in fact, the, the, that, that a replacing the terminal, the same, same size terminal on another location, will not affect all the, that, that shrinkage of the noise contour over time. If I can, let me just end here with, by, by, by reminding the public of some of the points that the mayor made uh, in introducing this presentation about upcoming meetings. Um, there are going to be a large number of meetings in the coming weeks to talk about issues having to do with the potential for a replacement airport, at the replacement terminal at the airport, the potential for developing what's called the opportunity site, that big vacant pro property that everybody sees along Hollywood Way. And these are up on the screen now for everyone to see. Uh, Monica, do you want to add anything about any of, any of these meetings in particular with, for the authority? Next Monday, as was announced, uh, we will um, have a study session on the 14-gate replacement terminal, and uh, we will have uh, the Burbank commissioners there as well to uh, help in, uh, introduce the idea of the replacement terminal. And we really encourage everyone from the community who has a concern or a preference or anything about a replacement terminal to please come out and join us and to let us hear everything so that we can uh, address the concerns, comments, uh, great ideas. It's at 6 p.m. in the Sky Room. Uh, parking will be validated and uh, it's on the second floor of Terminal A. Main entrance, there'll be signs that will direct you to the Sky Room. And with that, Madam Mayor, we turn it back to you for what your pleasure is here. Well, thank you both. And um, thank you for hosting this study session tonight at 645. We have talked in the past, and I want to thank the city manager and the city attorney for moving it up at a time when we know folks are home and they can listen and watch if they can't be here themselves. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, I would like to ask any of my colleagues if you have questions of the presentation at this time. Vice Mayor Gordon, followed by Council Member Talamantes. Thank you both for your presentation. It's very informative. In the PowerPoint presentation, you provide various noise contour maps, CNEL contour maps over a period of time showing your changes. Do those contour maps reflect noise mitigation efforts of insulating homes? No. The contour maps themselves are just depicting the actual noise exposure. So I don't know if you want to try and get it back to there. Um, we do have maps that will then show what homes have or have not been sound insulated within those contours, but the contour itself is just a depiction of the noise exposure, not the um, incompatible residences that underlie those contours. It is just a depiction of the noise exposure. So the contour maps that are being presented reflect the ambient noise levels in these areas independent of any changes in insulation of the homes in that area? Um, it, it depicts the noise levels, actually, um, which is a little different than ambient. Ambient uh, noise is a, is a calculation of the cars on the street, the you know, okay. lawnmower going by, and the uh, uh, but it's just aircraft noise. It does not depict anything okay. but the aircraft okay. component. I'll rephrase that. Okay. They depict the noise that's created by the airport or airline or airplane component apart from the ambient noise, specifically independent of insulated homes. Absolutely, sir. Okay. You're correct. Now, When you laid out the history uh, in various stages, it talks about the airport spending $105 million on residences for insulation or schools, et cetera, elementary schools. In fact, that money is channeled through the airport from the federal government for this purpose. Is that correct? 
We receive grants that are 80% uh, federal grant and 20% local share. So of the 105 uh, million that has been sent, spent, 80% of that is federal funding from the FAA. The other 20% is local funding, airport funds. And the motivation for the airport spending their 20% share is? Good neighbor? To be a good neighbor and to minimize the uh, noise exposure on the surrounding homes. And, and, and perhaps to be a little bit unfair to Monica and her colleagues, the city has put a lot of pressure on the airport authority for the last 40 years to, to spend that money. Now, that $20 million, just to be clear, was not taxpayer money from Burbank taxpayers. It came from users of the airport, from, from lease rates and from taxes at the airport, but not from the general tax base of Burbank. So not that the authority wouldn't have done this anyway without our pressure, but our pressure, I'm sure, was helpful. Perhaps encouragement is a softer word. Thank you. You're much better than I am at this. Um, <clears throat> you discussed the issue correctly raised repeatedly about concerns of the community for easterly takeoffs. I'm not sure about the prevailing winds, but in the discussion, I don't believe anywhere it says that the FAA prohibits flights to the east. Yes, the FAA has prohibited flights to the east by large aircraft, essentially by the commercial aircraft, as a result of all these factors. If not including in any way the presence of the existing terminal. Well, I, it, it, that, that's actually a hard question to answer because the FAA did not tell us all of the reasons why they why they uh, prohibited aircraft departures to the east. We can speculate that the terminal was certainly a factor, but these other factors have nothing to do with what goes on at the airport, so in a sense they're immutable. Now, if the terminal is removed, these other factors remain. Is the terminal number six or number 12 or number four? We don't know. The, Air, the FAA hasn't told us where it fits on the, on the range of factors. But when you have the other remaining five factors still there, the, the, the key point we want to make is that the existence of the removal of the terminal doesn't remove those other five factors. Well, I would stipulate that we don't, shouldn't anticipate the Verdugo Mountains moving anytime soon. I, I certainly hope okay. not. Okay. However, the traffic patterns from LAX and other airports in the area, I think, are also controlled by altitude. So even though their flights may crisscross at different altitudes, they could operate. And in fact, historically, flights have taken off from the, to the east and have simply circled around Burbank and gone back. In the past, when, when large aircraft have taken off from the east, it was many, many years ago when the traffic density in Southern California was considerably less than it was today. And the other factor, which, which again, very quickly gets well beyond my technical capability, but changing flight tracks in a complex urban area like Southern California is very difficult because of sort of the ripple effect. If you move this flight track, then you have to move another flight track to another airport and it affects another airport. And, and so I, I think it is minimizing the complexity to say the flight tracks can change. Yes, in theory, flight tracks can change, but it's not a particularly simple process. And that's, one of, that, that's a, a key factor for the FAA. Do you want to add something? Um, what I think here is, is really um, something that has changed since the FAA has uh, Im implemented the uh, restriction on uh, large aircraft over 12,500 pounds to the east has been the FAA's requirement of the approval of the uh, one engine inoperable procedures. That has really happened in the last 20 years where the FAA has much greater scrutiny and control over those procedures and every airline has to have those procedures approved by the federal government on an annual basis. Now, why the runway eight departures are so difficult is that you have to have a procedure in place for e each aircraft engine. You do not turn a plane into a dead engine. So if your right engine goes out, you do not turn right. So in theory, if you were to lose your left engine, you could make a right-hand turn and circle back and go into the airport, and the FAA would approve that procedure. However, when you go to uh, the other way, and where the aircraft would need to turn left, it could not make, the climb rate of a single engine could not 
get over the Verdugo Mountains, and that's an unsafe procedure. And therefore, the FAA would not approve airline departures on runway eight because they can't have a safe one inch and inoperable procedure approved. That is something that in the last 20 years, the FAA has really beefed up the requirements. Um, some airports have even put in, uh, airports and cities have even uh, increased the height restrictions surrounding airports on building to include the one inch and inoperable rather than just the standard FAA surfaces because it is a much bigger issue. Uh, it's an increased level of safety and it is certainly an increased level of <coughs> oversight that the FAA has put on the airlines and their procedures. And I suspect with that explanation, it depends also on the length of the runway, which is my next comment, in that the east-west runway presently stops at Vineland Avenue. But mysteriously, the property further to the west is vacant. And with a little bit of engineering, could easily be extended at quite a distance, politics being considered. Let me, let me see if I can answer that question, because that's actually... That was a softball. I don't know if it was intended to be. Well, of course, Peter. I throw them out every now and then. By, <laughs> by state law, the airport authority has no authority to lengthen any runway at the airport, period. It has no authority. So if the airport commission were to vote to extend the runway, it has no authority to do that. It can't buy land to extend the runway. It can't do it. Now, why does that land exist there? It's because at the end of every runway, there is supposed to be a runway safety area, which is a very large area at the end that's designed to deal with either aircraft going off the end on one end or landing too early and to protect people on the ground. At the other end, of run, uh, at runway 8 end, there isn't that safety area. We used and, to have a gas station there. And yes, uh, we, we remember the Southwest Airlines that uh, pulled up to get refueling at the gas station. And you know, knock on wood, nobody was seriously injured there. Instead of a runway safety area at that end, they have now installed something called EMAS, Engineered Material Arresting System, which is, in hyper-technical terms, it's like whipped cream made out of concrete. It's this really fluffy stuff. Can I see stuff? Okay. It, it's really fluffy stuff that if an aircraft um, uh, plows into, it sort of sit, it, 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 it stops the aircraft. I mean, it's like quicksand. And the FAA has approved the use of EMAS at runway ends where there's not enough space to have a full compliant runway safety area. So that's the reason why you have a large vacant area at one end and you have EMAS at the other. And if you take a look at the EMAS stuff, looks pretty cool. I'll bring some in for you maybe sometime. <laughs> one other thing, and uh, on that end, it is the approach into our single <coughs> instrument landing approach. So there is, that, that, that land is not actually empty. It has all of the components, all of the lighting, all of the equipment that provides information on um, the instrument landing systems in, in aircraft to safely guide a plane down. It provides a lot, it doesn't just provide horizontal control to help you guide it, it also provides vertical control. And that has to be extended from the runway, it can't be to the side or anything else, it has to be directly. So that land is not actually vacant. It's there, it's part of our instrument landing system going into the airport. That's FAA owned, but it is a part of the system. Last pitch. You mentioned that every pilot knows about the curfew. The guy who took off at 10 after 10 last night in a great big plane over Hollywood Way, he needs to be reminded. And in addition, that is a regular occurrence. And the fact that they haven't been fined, based on your report, I'm not sure how the fining procedure goes. But there definitely are some issues with the voluntary curfew as far as people taking off in the evening. Thank you. We need to be really clear about what the curfew covers. The curfew covers commercial operations at night, and it covers general aviation, that is private aircraft that are stage two, the noisiest aircraft. So a general aviation stage three aircraft is allowed to take off at night under the voluntary curfew. Now, I don't know the particular aircraft, and I assume, Monica, we, you could probably check to find out. But it may, it may be a corporate aircraft, and it may be a stage three. It doesn't mean it's not offensive. It doesn't mean the, the airport authority doesn't encourage pilots not to take off at 10 after 10. Uh, but it is not technically covered by the curfew. If, if indeed it was a corporate plane, I, I don't know the answer, of course. 
Uh, I was going to thank you, Mr. Telemontes. Councilmember Brick, followed by Councilmember Telemontes. Yeah, I was going to say briefly, only in comments to uh, Dr. Gordon. Uh, first thing, I, when they mentioned about prevailing winds, <clears throat> and I think he kind of felt like maybe it wasn't so much that, kind of the impression I got. I mean, I see it all the time. And of course, Mr. Fager is out there. He could probably tell us, I'm going to guess, 10 to 12 days out of the year where the prevailing winds change and you'll see the planes taking off. Normally they go out, what I say, to the south and veer out to the west over the cemetery. And of course, they're coming from the west. Uh, <clears throat> I see them close to my business because the prevailing winds uh, switching and stuff like that. So it, it's, I think the pilot has the, the call on which direction to go. Uh, it's their judgment decision. Just like you talk about a flight, we have flights that are scheduled at 656, 658, and they'll sit on the runway and wait till 7 o'clock and pull it back and take off, even though they're scheduled a little bit earlier. Uh, so in regards to what, what you were talking about uh, last night and the night before, a couple minutes after 10 of plane taking off, plane taking off you know, I, I get a lot of people from the TSA down in my business when the airport closes, so I'm, I have a pretty good idea what's going on when planes are coming in or taking off late due to weather conditions. They could be coming in from Denver on a delayed flight, or a flight could be coming in uh, late getting to Burbank, and so it's late taking off, so they are allowed to take off a little bit after 10 o'clock, is my understanding, because of the uh, weather delays and stuff like that. But uh, I started to say, but uh, Mr. Kirsch, uh, or the young lady hit it right on the head that uh, on the commercial airlines uh, or stage two general aviation, uh, they are restricted to 10 o'clock at night. Uh, general, avi a general aviation, which is your stage three airplanes, because they're so much quieter, there's no restrictions on them. So technically they can take off and land 7.24. So I wasn't sure which plane you were talking about taking off a little bit after seven, but there are restrictions on uh, the flights that can and can't take off. But obviously, a lot of it has to do with uh, weather permitting and stuff like that. Thank you. Councilmember Telemontes, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> no, just Followed a couple. Councilmember thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for giving us this presentation and for shedding the, some light on some misinformation that I've heard for many, many years. You know, it's easy for somebody to go up, up there and say something that isn't factual. Um, but it's obviously the professionals like yourself, uh, you, Mr. Kirshen, in particular, that has been involved with this for the last 30 years. Uh, I want to thank you for setting the record straight and letting the public know, especially the residents of our community, um, what we've gone through, the history of the airport, and where we're going. Um, you know, and I reflect on uh, the aircraft noise footprint. That picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, when you look at that that slide that tells you where we were between 78 and 90 to present. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable the, the progress we made in technology uh, as far as the aircraft is concerned. Um, now, you also mentioned the fact that as of June 30th, there yet over 2,300 residents and four elementary schools have been insulated. That was on slide number 17. Uh, is Luther Burbank Middle School, has, have they been insulated? Yes, they have. They are one of the ones that have been insulated, yes. Um, Luther Burbank and Ningay Adult School are both in Burbank, are the two that were tentatively. So are they included in that four yeah, elementary? Four. Is that what that is? Yes. So four schools. Four schools. Okay. Two, two were in L.A. Um, no, and I, you know, I encourage the public to attend these uh, meetings, uh, study sessions. That's what they're there for. If you have any concerns, um, come out, share them with us. We want to, obviously, the... Uh, airport people, airport authority uh, representatives from Burbank want to hear the residents' concerns. So please come out and share your concerns with us. Um, that's the only way we can make it better. And Council Member Talamantes, I might also say that, that you folks and your predecessors on the City Council and your colleagues on the Airport Commission all need to give yourselves a pat on the back because these improvements didn't happen overnight. They didn't happen by themselves. Uh, it was because the airport commission, the airport staff, the city councils over the course of the last 30 years have, have been just relentless in insisting that noise get addressed. And, and as you know, I, I work in airport communities around the country, and I can say without doubt that there's not a single community in the United States that has seen this kind of improvement. 
the combination of redu reduction in noise, some of which, is, of course, is a function of technology, but also the mitigation. $105 million, in my book, is a lot of money for noise insulation, and it's one of the top in the country in terms of noise insulation. So all of these pieces combined have, have, have produced a, a far better quality of life in Burbank and Los Angeles than would have existed if you simply had done nothing. Thank you very much. And I w just want to mention one thing. I was on duty that night that, that uh, Southwest Airlines came on to Hollywood Way and this close to the gas station. When we turned the corner and I saw that coming in on the fire engine. I saw that plane. I'm going, oh, my God. But anyway, it was, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Councilmember Frutas. Thank you. I live by the airport. And I think the two noisiest airplanes right now that you have in is UPS, it takes off at 7.35, because I can feel it and I can hear it, and then right behind it is FedEx. And they're pretty pretty noisy, they're the biggest airplanes, but they're, you can definitely feel it. And then the second question is, um, I've noticed more and more smaller aircraft, because I'm on the east side of the uh, airport, are starting to take off, including the newest airline that is within California, is all going to the east, and it's, you can hear it. Okay, first, um, yes, the UPS and FedEx uh, aircraft are probably more noticeable. Two reasons. First being, those are the largest uh, scheduled op uh, aircraft that operate at the airport. So they're going to have a bigger footprint because they've got bigger engines. That said, they're also heavier. They're carrying cargo, so they don't climb as quickly. They're perfectly safe in every way, but they don't have uh, the ability to uh, climb out quite as quickly because they're heavier. So th those two things do certainly make those operations a little bit noisy, noisier. Um, the, the runway departures uh, to the east, the uh, new airline, they are under 12,500 pounds. That's actually a prop aircraft, and they do take off to the east. Um, mostly to keep them, they're, they're such a small plane, they're handled as if they are a general aviation aircraft, to keep them out of the pattern of the large commercial aircraft because they don't fly as quickly. So they separate, segregate the traffic a little bit by keeping uh, that much slower, uh, less performing uh, aircraft out of the way of the uh, commercial aircraft that fly much more quickly and uh, have a lot of different standards. So that they're doing that to separate them out a little bit. But I don't know if you've seen that aircraft up, up close. It's only a nine passenger aircraft. So it is, we're, we're talking a very small aircraft. A lot of our corporate jets are much, much larger than that particular aircraft. Here's some trivial. <laughs> what other big airplane is definitely recognizable more than um, UP, uh, UPS or FedEx, and there's only two in the whole system, and you can clearly see it when it takes off. No, not Air Force One. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, C5. I, I, I got you. Okay. C-17. Uh, Shamu. <laughs> Literally, from my house, every time I see the Southwest take off, that's how I watch the airport, it looks like Shamu's free will he's taken off. <laughs> Yes. I, I, th I think probably folks who are loyal to Arizona State University might comment that that plane is more noticeable. <laughs> Southwest has painted a number of their aircraft uh, out of uh, loyalty to their various markets. So you may notice Shamu, but I bet some people notice the Arizona aircraft too. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, going back to the, the chart that, that you showed, and it was the latest uh, airport forecast all flights. and. Your comment was that in 2007 we had a peak in flights, then flights dropped way off, and now there's kind of a steady but slow increase projected through, well, at least 2030, which is way out there. It's hard for me to even plan next year, much less 2030. But um, I wondered if you could speak to the peak that's shown here. Is that our experience in 2007? It wasn't clear, because the date's not by the chart. It, it's 2006 into 2007 was the peak uh, operations at the airport. Oh. Okay. Okay, perfect. There we go. There, we got it. We got it up. Ms. Byrne, <laughs> that was magic. <laughs> um, 
what happened there, that was the beginning of the major recession. And um, the fuel price volatility. Um, there had been uh, previous recessions where you can see that there were slight downticks, particularly 1990, that was a major recession. You can see that there was a falling off. But even in those recessions, the fuel volatility was not quite as great. And um, in 2006 into 2007 is when the recession began and the fuel volatility and the airlines had a major reduction in operations and we had an, a very major reduction in the number of passengers. In one year from 2006 to 2007 it was a 13 percent reduction, the next year it was a 29 percent reduction in the number of passengers. So those are all related to recession. People aren't flying if they're worried about money. Um, and also, the airlines have reduced their flights. Um, I think probably anyone who flies today experiences full planes. Can mm -hmm. you remember back when, when you know there were empty seats? I can, but it never happens anymore. And that's because the airlines have gotten smart. They have reduced the excess seats out of out of each market so that they fly the planes as full as they possibly can because they make the most money that way. Because fuel is not cheap anymore, and that is such a huge price point for them that they have to have every plane be as um, efficient as possible. So they're, they're packing more people onto planes than they used to. That said, it redu it, that reduces, that's actually good for noise. It's good for your community because as planes get fuller, reduces the number of flights. So you might have the exact same number of operation, number of uh, passengers flying out of an airport, but with fewer operations. And the trend is for a little bit larger aircraft, which are still quieter even than what's currently flying today, with a few more seats. You'll hear Southwest is adding seats to some of its aircraft, buying newer aircraft that have a few more seats. Well, all that means is, is that you're able to fly more passengers on fewer operations, and operations are what drive your noise. We were talking earlier about the noise level contours, the, the maps, and I, I wondered how, how these were, how was the noise contour originally established? Did we put out sensors to track the noise, or was it? Yes, and there's another way. The federal government requires that you use a model. It's called the integrated noise model. It's the only thing that the federal government recognizes as defining the aircraft noise exposure. However, the airport does have a, an extensive noise monitoring system which has sensors out all over the community. And um, we verify the noise contour every quarter. When we calculate it through INM, we verify that it is in concert, that it makes sense with our noise measurements for that area in every single location around the airport. So it's yes and the con it's modeled and measured both. So the measurement, we do have physical, then we do like a physical measuring of the sound and compare that to the model to Absolutely. confirm that the model is still accurate. Absolutely. I wondered Absolutely. about that because sometimes we get in a discussion up here about theoretical traffic modeling and as far as I know nobody can like actually do it because we're always looking in the future. So I think it's very important to know that we, we actually have sensors out in the community as well that can that can test the noise contours. The um, Bob Hope Airport had one of the first airport noise monitoring systems in the United States and recently just replaced it at a very high expense, um, millions of dollars to replace, and has the most cutting edge equipment, uh, the same as LAX, same as Chicago O'Hare, that kind of, uh, of a system uh, is installed here at Burbank. Uh, my next question is about noise again, and that is, um, I know you said that we had one incident where there was a fine, and I want to know how we investigate noise violations, because I think all of us have gotten at least one communication from a community member who said, oh, 10, you know, a plane flew at, at 2 a.m. and a plane flew at 4 a.m. How do we investigate those violations? What's our process? Every morning, our noise staff goes into the noise monitoring system. It's not just noise that it monitors, it monitors all operations. We have a radar feed from the FAA that we can look at every single aircraft that arrives or departs from the facility. So every morning, they look back at the night bef before and look at the aircraft types that departed. Um, and they see, OK, did we have any planes that are not allowed to fly between 10 PM and 7 AM to depart? 
If they did, they, the, some of those aircraft can depart if they are under a certain weight and operate a different, you know, a different way. So if that plane departed, our noise staff contacts the owner of the aircraft and requires the weight and balance of the plane to see if they are under the weight that would allow them to fly. If they provide, they will provide the weight and balance. If they are overweight and if they, it, you know, a lot of, uh, in the most recent one, the gentleman just admitted, I didn't, I'm not familiar here. I didn't know about the ordinance. I violated it. And so we send them a violation and uh, they've actually already paid the, the fine, which is over $6,000. But every single day, this is a part of our noise and environmental staff. They go in and look at the operations every single day, not just the complaints. They look every morning to see what operated that night to see if there's any violations. Now that's violation of the noise rules that we're able to find. For the scheduled operations, the commercial air carriers, we don't require that they not fly out. So let's say there's a weather delay and that plane is scheduled to leave at 950. We don't strand those passengers and require that that plane wait till the next day. We do allow that operation. But what we do is we track those late departures over time to see if there is a chronically late flight with the airlines. And if so, we investigate it with the station manager, remind them and their um, uh, scheduling department that, that that's violation of the scheduled. And uh, we haven't had that recently. Uh, I think in years past, we may have had some that, that departed a little early. And we were able to correct that because our staff was watching the trends and said, yeah, you're getting out two minutes before seven. You're getting out a minute before seven. No, you have to wait till after seven and have corrected that behavior. Uh, I think um, when we find out, when the, the vice mayor said a plane took off at 1010 10 last night, was it? So the task will be to find out what kind of a plane that was and why it took off then. Great big one. <laughs> I will, I will um, respond to everyone with what I do. You know, I, I, I think that, that discussing the Eastern departure is critical information, and, and of course, nobody's moving the mountains. So, uh, but you said something interesting, and I just wanted to confirm w when the FAA made this decision. You, you made a comment about in emergency conditions, if a pilot lost an engine, then they would be limited in turning one direction or the other, and that the and I wasn't clear on this. The FAA has a rule now about this. When was that rule promulgated, and can you go back and is it recent? Is it a decade old? It's, it's yeah, between it's, it's, fifteen and twenty years. It's, the, the, the the FAA put the restriction on eastern departures at this airport in the mid nine eighties. I can give you the exact date. I'll have to look it up. Um, but the, the one engine inoperable procedures have been started to be enforced by the FAA much more strictly in about the last 10 or 15 years. Okay. Well, if council members have no more questions, I'd like to um, th thank you and ask you to please have a seat. I'm going to invite, as I said in the beginning, that everyone uh, who wished to could comment on the presentation after the presentation and ask that you fill out a blue card. So I have a speaker who would like to comment now and that is Esper, Esther Espinosa. Ms. Espinosa, would you like to come up and comment now on the noise discussion? And while Ms. Espinosa is coming up, I, I, I want to again thank you both, but say that it's a great credit to predecessor councils who have kept the, the push on the shoulder to the wheel in seeking and mandating compliance and our current council members who are currently liaisons also continue to do that as well as our airport commissioners. So it's, um, it's a real credit to the city for having stayed on top of this. Ms. Espinosa is the first speaker followed by Mike Nolan. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, I'm going to start with a, they say that noise levels today are substantially lower than they have ever been in the past. Noise is un unlikely ever to reach the peak levels 
in a way, who brought it up? For a long time, they were, saying, they were not saying nothing about noise. They were not saying nothing about noise. Now they revived it. Because maybe some people have been ignored for the concerns of the noise levels in their, in their vicinity, in their neighborhoods. Because um, it says right here that the authority applied for permission to impose a curfew under the federal law, 160 study. Authority actively pursued a part 161 study for nine plus years at a cost of $700,000. AVA rejected that application in 2009. So that, that's when the whole thing quieted down, but the people st are still concerned about the noises in, in their homes and in the neighborhood. Because I, sometimes I could hear the airplanes way up to my house. And so, um, but uh, they revived this noise thing. And yet they say that uh, there's less, less noise. But uh, who's the one who's complaining now? How about in some valley? In some valley where, there, where there's a lot of poor people living there, and there's a lot of noise there in some valley, because I have friends there. And boy, it's, it's scary when the planes go by and make a lot of noise. And have you, have you uh, soundproofed their homes? I want to know. Are they the ones who are complaining and some, have some been left out here in Burbank that you haven't uh, soundproofed their homes? Because I'm glad that the schools were soundproofed because when my kids were going there, there was a lot of noise. They couldn't, they couldn't even hear the teacher or they couldn't even study. And so that's why I want to know. Because, and they say that the only thing is legislative, legislative uh, to contact. It says, um, legislation is the last tool available for a mandatory curfew. Congressman Schiff and Sherman are actively seeking special federal legislation to allow a curfew with support of the city and authority. Anyway, yes, there's supposed to be some kind of legislation because of protective legislation. Okay. The state must protect the natural private rights of individuals, families, and legitimate associations of individuals, life, limb, and health of individuals must be safeguarded, not only from the malice of other men, but also from the untoward and, and acts of intimate agencies. A man's person must be secure. Stop there. Anyway, they're supposed to be secure. And you're supposed to care for the people that, that uh, are living around there because uh, that protects their lives. Because when there's a lot of noise, the kids can't sleep. And then when they go to school, they can't study. And um, noise, 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 noise. The children hear about it, and they comment about it. And they can't sleep, and children need a good night's sleep. And the working man needs to sleep so he can go refresh to work in the mornings. So. We need legislation here. We need, uh, we need, you know, to um, for a curfew, and we, we need to uh, do more for the citizens of Burbank. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Nolan. That's the last card I have. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I really appreciate you having taking this time tonight. I'm particularly appreciative of Peter and Miss Newhouse and sharing the information they did. And Emily, it, it's important for us to take notice of exactly your questions. This situation has gone on for so long and people have moved in and moved out of Burbank. School children here know from their tours with Miss Lucy that's here, that you can go inside the terminal and see a map of this area with the lights and with your ear as you hear a plane taking off, you can watch the progression or the progress of that plane as it hits those very sensors. 
you were busy working in downtown LA, I understand. But in reality, it is a help every so often to remind people that when they come up with this noise information, these monitoring points aren't being moved around like on the back of a pickup truck. So they can look at the trends, and as was pointed out, and I think that's a big thing for Burbank people to know, they check every day, or when they're there at the office, to see what occurred and who did it. That's the critical part. There was a time when we had a hearing on a noise variance here in this city, right in this council chamber, where it came out that yes, the judge had required the airport to have a hotline for complaints. But Mr. Bill Riddell advised the administrative law judge, but the order didn't require them to listen to the tape. So they had not listened and hadn't transcribed in over a year. They had no idea what the complaints were that came in. That was a long time ago. We've come a long way since then. And I'd like the record to reflect that it's meetings like this where we get that information put out, and that's why you use your example, Madam Mayor. It's no problem to bring people current and to answer simple questions sometimes of how do we develop this information? And are these points stationary? It also is a help to hear like Jess. I was there too that night when that plane came across Hollywood Way. Right up to the signal po the, the post with the prices. And there were the pumps right there. You could see the wings. It was quite spectacular. I think Ross Benson has some pretty realistic pictures, but those firefighters were the first responders there. And it was a big wake-up call to some people who love our airport. I was head of a homeowners association that supported the public acquisition, and I'm not reticent to readily admit that. I have confidence in these people. The people that you have representing us now on the airport authority are knowledgeable, they have the history, and I believe them when they speak with us. We have had intramural problems with the other cities on occasion. We had one commissioner who wanted to have flights to Cuba, if you remember. We've had some, some interesting go-rounds. But we've also had people like Commissioner Holden, who even stopped to help a stranded Burbank motorist at Burbank at Five Points when he was on the way to a, a meeting uh, that we were holding on the airport. I believe we need to encourage our commissioners to continue to learn as much as they can for us. We need people like Peter Kirsch and Ms. Newhouse to continue to stay on top of the situation so that when decision points come up, we're all more knowledgeable so that we can be supportive of efforts. We're not going to win all the time, but if we didn't step up as Liers pushed to acquire that airport, there is the chance that that airport could have been shut down. Lockheed had no interest and no need anymore. They weren't flying off finished aircraft anymore. San Fernando had just closed down. Remember, they were supposed to be originally one of our partners. I'm very encouraged, and I thank you. I know this has taken some time, and I've taken a little more too. But I feel very comfortable stating to you my comfort zone. I applaud them, and I hope they'll stay the course and keep fighting to keep the airport open for all of us and try to help it to be a better neighbor. God bless everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Nellen. Um, that is the last card I have on public comment. Um, thank you for your kind words. I wondered if, Madam City Attorney, you have any closing comments? Mr. Kirsch, Ms. Newhouse, do you have any closing comments? If you don't mind, Madam Mayor, Please. members of the council, members of the public and staff, um, I'm total agreement with what the last speaker had to say. I truly appreciate the cooperation and the working together that's been going on between the authority and the city for at least since I've been here. And I think 
believe you've seen the culmination in that working together over the last several months, starting with our study session on July 9th about the future of the airport. Tonight's study session, I encourage everyone to attend the airport study session on September 16th. There's a lot of dates. We have another um, community meeting scheduled for September 20. Six, thank you. I was like, okay, there's two nights it could be. The 26th, it's a Thursday night. You're going, there's, it will be on our webpage. There's going to be more discussions about it was on the um, PowerPoint and we're also going to follow up and that's going to be a discussion about both the terminal and especially the opportunity 58 acre site. We're going to follow up that discussion at our town hall meeting on October 1st. There is a lot happening over the next couple months and we are trying to come up with as many avenues for people to be involved. So if you want to be involved, um, please look at the websites. Please keep track of the dates. We welcome everyone's input. But again, I really do want to um, thank Peter and Monica as well as Mark Hardiman who is not here but worked v also very hard on this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would say I hope as we move forward we continue to remind the, the public and I guess I'll ask Ms. Byrne if she can help out also on this that when we have our council meetings there's an announcement that we can announce when the meetings are happening, where they're happening, where to go on the internet so that we have a regular city council announcement going out to encourage as many people from the community and business community and residential community to participate as possible in this process. Thank you. We're going to move on.